Een betere wereld? Begint met het besef dat er nog een wereld te winnen is. Een wereld waarin gelijke kansen de normaalste zaak van de wereld zijn. Zonder voorsprong. Maar wie zijn wij om iets te zeggen als nog geen 30% van onze top vrouw is? Goed bezig zijn is niet goed genoeg. Ja, er is een hele wereld te winnen. En dat begint bij onszelf. Maar daarvoor hebben we mensen nodig die een verschil kunnen maken. Zoals jij. Begin bij ons. Welcome. So, um, thank you for joining me uh, to my talk about how to implement buzzwords. But before I go into that, I'll give a short introduction of myself. My name is Timothy. I work for a company called Skyworks. They're a boutique company, consultancy company, which helps scale-ups, startups, and enterprises uh, move to the cloud by shifting their mindset into a cloud-native way. So my presentation is split into two. The first part is the story of Hip Company. And I'm going to give a bit of a disclaimer here. Hip Company is a completely fictitious company. Any resemblance to any other company, your company or any other company in the world, is completely coincidental. Seems a bit like a South Park uh, preemptive uh, disclaimer here. After the story, uh, I want to go into what can be done, what can be learned from the story of Hip Company. So the story starts with Hip Company. Hip Company is the company to be at. It's an up and coming company. It provides a SaaS service and they're looking at exponential growth. Everybody wants to be Hip Company. Everybody wants to work for Hip Company. Everybody wants to work for Hip Company because they're the kind of company that has a ping pong table. And who doesn't like playing ping pong, ping pong or table tennis, according to what part of the world you are from? The ping pong table is in a meeting room. We, we can see it's a meeting room because there is a whiteboard there. Uh, it's okay because we love ping pong. We want to play table tennis. We want to create our own company tournament. And a ping pong table can be folded away and put in the corner, and then we can have our meetings. Once the meeting is over, ping pong table comes back up, and off you go. Hip Company is also the kind of company that has a console. It's either a PS4, PS5 if you're lucky, uh, <laughs> or a Switch to do, you know, a bit of Mario Karting. Um, I'm actually quite good at Mario Kart. Uh, so, so I've, I've been to Hip Company, and, and Hip Company has that Switch Mario Kart game. So when the ping pong table is being used, other developers can actually be playing around after hard work. And also Hip Company has Friday drinks. And who doesn't like Friday drinks? Friday drinks has a plethora of drinks. Uh, well, actually, now it's more like a Zoom call with bring your own drinks because of Corona. But... Hip Company is hip. That's why they're doing the Zoom Bring Your Own Friday drink party. Hip Company is hip. I mean, they're the kind of company that works hard. And uh, look at them working hard over there. All those laptops around the table. Again, pre-corona, obviously. Um, but they don't only work hard. They play harder. Um, I love this. I think the marketing manager that came up with this, work hard but play harder, must have been a genius. Who doesn't want, after a long week of working hard, play even harder? Um, I don't know. Maybe it's my age. Uh, but you can look at him. Look at him. He is, he is playing hard. Maybe a bit too much. <laughs> um, but not everything is looking quite all right at Hip Company. It's, it's, it's the, the working hard, playing hard, not really sure what's going on. They're feeling a bit boomerish. Um, and, and, and it feels like you've, they've got a monolithic application. Uh, they've been told that monoliths are uh, scary and, and you shouldn't be using a monolithic application. Bug fixes take forever because apparently that's the reason you have a monolith. Bug fixes take forever. The deployments are only done quarterly. It's a complete chaotic situation. The devs team and the ops team aren't really communicating. They're doing their own thing. Um, hip management is not feeling hip anymore. So what can they do? They're scratching their heads. They're thinking, how can we become hip? So hip management goes into the hip boardroom 
moving away the ping pong table, obviously, and and they start flip charting. They're flip charting really hard. They're, they've got their Lenovo ThinkPads. They're managing their hip management. They're going to find a solution. They think, okay, what can we do to make hip company better? How can we make hip company hip? So they're Googling, okay, hip company, monolith, what can we do? Monolith, bad. Hip, good. What can we do with monolith? Anti-monolith situation for hip company. Well, you guessed it. The monolith is becoming a microservice. Yep. We all want to implement the microservices. Everybody's talking about microservices. You want a microservice. I want a microservice. Hip company wants a microservice. Well, you can get courses about microservices. There is a book going from monolith to microservices. It's, it's amazing. Hip company is going to be the microservices company. That's the hip way of doing things. And not only that, microservices is a three-in-one buzzword. If you're doing microservices, you're doing containers. Or should I say Docker? Uh, we'll, we'll say we're doing containers. And you guessed it. Yep. We're doing containers. You need the co container orchestration system. Kubernetes. Yep. We're going to do Kubernetes too. That's the buzzword. That's everybody's talking about. There's KubeCon, 10,000 people. And Kelsey Hightower is the Kubernetes guy. Who doesn't want to implement Kubernetes? Well, HIP management has decided, yep, we're going to implement microservices. We're going to do containers. We're going to do Kubernetes. Our developers are going to love this. Well, uh, we've got the monolith. How are we going to fix that monolith? You see there, it's it's bland. It's talking to 1DB. HIP management is thinking, well, yeah, let's do that monolith into a microservice. Yeah, it's all running on Kubernetes. Looking at it, it's still not, I'm not feeling the hipness yet. HIP management goes, well, there you go. That's microservice. -y. That is micro. We've got all the microservices on Kubernetes. They're all running as a microservice system. We'll all connect it. And it's a bit of a mishmash. That's okay. We're doing Kubernetes. We're doing microservices. Every microservice is connecting to the one database because it's okay. We're doing microservices. All the microservices are talking to that one microservice in the middle. It's usually called common uh, in your Git repo. Uh, but we're doing microservices. Everybody's happy. HIP management has shown their developers this is what we're going to do. In the meantime, your developers are, hey, what, am we, what am I doing? That one person who once created the AWS account on S3 is thinking, wait, I've got to learn Kubernetes now? OK, I'll, I'll, well, it's OK. I'll get a free ticket to KubeCon, free trip, well, free virtual trip nowadays. But it's, we're going to do hip. We're going to be hip. We're going to do microservices. But as you might have guessed, it's, it's not really going as planned. At one deployment, which is in the middle, common. Every time it gets deployed, it's breaking half the system because everything's talking to it. To it. Uh, deployments are taking forever because nobody wants to touch common anymore. Uh, nobody's really talking to each other unless one is blaming against the other. So HIP management is really annoyed. It's like, what? why is this not working? We've implemented microservices. We've implemented Kubernetes. These are the buzzwords we want. Why isn't it working? What do the devs and the ops team need to do to get better? So hip management go back into the meeting room, ping pong table away. They're in the meeting room, they're scratching their heads. Okay, the dev team, the ops team, they need to be communicating together. We need the devs and the ops and the ops doing one thing. What can the devs and the ops? Yep, you've guessed it. We're doing DevOps. DevOps it is. DevOps everywhere. We've got companies offering you a one button click DevOps situation. Um, you can become a DevOps engineer. There is a DevOps uh, yearly story, uh, DevOps um, story of, of how companies are doing. HIP management can fill in the form, ship it out, and compare themselves against other companies. DevOps is the way to do it. We'll compare ourselves against Netflix. We'll compare against ourselves against Spotify. They're also doing microservices, but we're also doing DevOps. Everybody's going to become a DevOps engineer now. No more developers. We're all DevOps engineers, whatever that may mean. Um, and just like microservices, DevOps is a three-in-one buzzword. If you're doing DevOps, you're agile. 
you're going to be shipping every two weeks now. That's what Agile is, shipping every two weeks. The, the, the software is going to go out every two weeks. And because you're doing Agile, you're scrumming. Not the rugby kind of scrum, but you're scrumming. Some developers might want to do the rugby scrum, but you're scrumming. You're doing DevOps. It's going to be awesome. We've even got a release manager now because we're doing Agile. Every two weeks, he's there with his watch. He's going, okay, three, two, one, deploy. And it's still a mess. That one database to rule them all is not really working. Uh, developers, or should I say DevOps engineers, are still storing the secrets and code. The features are still taking months, even though we're releasing every two weeks. What's going on? Bugs are being released actually every two weeks now rather than the quarterly. Ah! And your developers, DevOps engineers, are screaming at you. You've completely and managed to completely infuriate pretty much everybody. That one guy who created the AWS account has left the building. He has no clue what was going on, so he, he decided to leave. So nobody knows what's going on. So that was the, the obviously fictitious story about hip company. But what can we learn from that? What, 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 what can we do? How, how can we learn from the story? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is to completely forget about buzzwords. Stop thinking about buzzwords. Easier said than done, because I've been shouting buzzwords to you uh, throughout the last 10 minutes. So. You're hearing microservices, DevOps, Kubernetes in your head. How can I forget about them? Well, the solution came to me from my uh, partner who teaches seven and eight-year-olds, uh, which is a bit telling of maybe how she treats me. <laughs> um, but she said, well, when I tell kids something, I need to tell, I tell them, well, think of something else completely different. If I tell you, think about the pink elephant, I'm fairly certain there are quite a few of you thinking about a pink elephant right now. Well, if I say pink elephant, you all should think rainbow colored Macau. So I'm saying pink elephant, rainbow colored Macau. There you go. That's even more beautiful. Isn't that better? Okay. How does this help me with buzzwords? Well, you need to shift the buzzword mentality into what you're trying to achieve. So if I say microservices, you should think modularity. You know, the 1970s programming software technique of modularity. Microservices, modularity. Similarly, if I'm thinking DevOps, or if I say DevOps to you, you should think communication between the ops and de Okay, maybe that's a little bit too long. You, you shout communication. So I say DevOps you shout communication. I say DevOps, you shout communication. This is where in my head I'm thinking you're shouting communication at the screen to me. So we start disassociating ourselves from buzzwords. We want to communicate more. You know, We want to make sure our programming is modular. Once you forget about those buzzwords, you start asking questions. Something hip management didn't really do. They didn't ask the questions, they just chased buzzwords. And you want to ask what, how, and why. What are you trying to implement? Well, what do you really want to achieve? Maybe you want to achieve faster releases. OK, why do you want to achieve faster releases? Well, do you want to achieve faster releases because your customers are requesting them? You want to achieve faster releases because the CEO is requesting them? Truly understand why you want to do this. And then once you figure that out, you can understand how you're going to do this. How are you going to achieve faster releases? And maybe it is with microservices. Maybe it is decoupling that uh, monolith. I mean, you don't want to create a decoupled monolith, but maybe it's decoupling, decoupling the, the system, having domains for your system. Or maybe it's just having better CICD into it. So once you figure the what, why, and how you want to tell everybody what you're going to do. You want to communicate. Communication is vital. You want to ensure that your development team is on board. You want to ensure that your sales team is 
talking to your development team to ensure that what they're producing is the correct thing for your customer. And you want to ensure that management is taking on board what the development is doing so that they can shift and twist accordingly. And part of that communication is documentation. Now, not everybody loves documentation. I, I'm not fond of documentation myself. I'd rather be creating software, creating value. But documentation is extremely important. I think I've only really met one software engineer who actually enjoyed documentation. Um, but he probably could never stop talking as well, which is why he enjoys documentation. But documentation doesn't only help the development team what you're showing, what you're trying to achieve. It also, it also helps yourself to put down on paper the three questions you're asking, the what, the why, the how. What are you doing? You're putting it down on paper. Why are you doing this? So, And how are you going to implement this? Why have you chosen that technology? So in six months' time, you can go back and think, oh, this is why we decided to do this. Once you've documented everything, once you've come to that final conclusion, you want to give the options because not everybody's going to be on board immediately. You want to give some options to some teams and maybe have only one team get on board. That one team will implement it, will see the benefit of what you're trying to implement, and that team will implement and then be the, the proponent of what you're going to implement. It will be the team who will push the idea for you. You don't need to force it on anybody, although those donuts look quite nice and being forced onto me probably isn't a bad idea. Um, so once you've done that and if people are using what you want to try and implement, you're going to automate it. Anything you're doing more than once is automatable. If, you, if it's a repeatable process, you want to automate it. You definitely want to automate your tests. You want to implement something and then you want to test it. And you want, don't want to spend time clicking around buttons. You want to automate those tests because you want to make sure that what you're implementing is correct. Uh, I'll tell you a story. This is quite apt for what we're looking at. I was an automotive engineer before I became a DevOps engineer or a platform engineer. Uh, and the first job I had was to attach a bunch of sensors to a component we were selling to one of the car manufacturers. So we needed to do this for warranty purposes. Once I had all those instrumentation, on top of that, I'd have the car. This was a prototype car from the customer, which would come in. I'd spend four to five days collecting data. And then from that data, I'd analyze it and confirm, yeah, you're good to go. We can warrant the part. Well, unbeknownst to me, the first time I actually do, did this, when I was obviously quite green at it, um, one of the sensors fell. Well, and after four or five days of collecting data, all I could see was zeros. Not, yeah, wasn't very happy when I had to call the customer back saying, yeah, could you ship the car over again? Because I didn't really collect anything. Now, had I implemented an automated way to test my collection, which I then actually did, I would have been a lot more confident in my analysis later on. I would have been a lot more confident in shipping the car back to the customer. So you definitely want to automate all of your testing. You want to ship them out, and you know you're testing correctly. If you miss some tests, well, you learn, you re-implement the tests, and off you go. Once you've automated your tests, you want to automate the build. The build is a repeatable process. If you're going to use containers, it's definitely repeatable. If you're creating images as an AMI, for example, it is a repeatable process. A, few uh, a small shell script will automate all of this for you. And you want to do this to reduce the cognitive load on your developers. The developers are there not to think, oh, how, how am I deploying this? How am I building my container? You want to do this because your developers should focus on providing that feature-rich system your clients want. So they're not going to think about building and creating a Docker image. All they need to do is push your, your code, and it gets automated, and it gets tested, and it gets built on its own. Once it's built, you automate the deployment. Again, 
automation. It's repeat. It's an it's a repeatable process. It's something you do over and over and over again. Maybe not skydiving, although the adventurous out of you might do that over and over again. But definitely shipping code. You definitely want to automate this over and over again. And again, the reason to do this is to remove that cognitive load of the developers, the dare to create those features, the dare to provide value for business, for your customers. Once everything's deployed, monitor everything and anything. Monitor everything and anything initially. Yes, you get a lot of noise, but once you figure out what that noise is, you can start removing it. If you're not monitoring it, if you're not recording it, how can you be alerted if something goes wrong? So monitor and record everything. Alert as much as possible. I think this is one thing that companies don't focus as much on as much as I wish, the monitoring of it. This is why probably Datadog and uh, companies like Elasticsearch make so much money because it's a big. it should be a big focus. Monitor as much as you can so that you can then alert on any issues. You don't need alerting. You don't want to monitor just for alerting issues. You want to monitor also to improve on your system. Maybe there is some latency which you can improve and make your system a lot better. You cannot do this without monitoring and having the appropriate metrics. So there you are. You've monitored. You've Everything's up and running, and you're getting alerts. First thing you do is don't panic. Unless you're in the toilet, you might have to panic a bit. But <laughs> but if you're getting alerts, don't panic. Uh, things go wrong. Um, and I've been in the situation where I've panicked a bit. You know, it's, it's, it's just natural. Things aren't happening as you thought they were going to be. Don't panic. Relax. Gather all the information. Get all the information and figure out what's going on. Why is it going on? What are the metrics telling you? What were the processes you took? Don't panic. Remain calm. It is difficult to deploy something extremely complex. So there you have it. As a recap, you want to be asking questions. You want to start off by asking those questions. You want to ask what, why, and how. Once, you ask the, once you've answered those questions, you want to communicate what you've done, what, you've come, what the decision was. You want to communicate why you've reached those decisions. And once you communicate, you want to automate. Automate everything, everything and anything possible. You want to automate your tests, you want to automate your builds, and you want to automate your deployments. And once everything's deployed, everything's out in production, everything's there, you want to monitor. You want to monitor and alert. So once you have those monitor and alerts, you can ask those questions again. And you can go through the loop again. I'm sure I've seen this before. I'm sure I've seen this icon. I'm, I've seen it. I'll come up with a, with a good buzzword for it. But I'm sure I've seen this before. And then final. Remember, this is this is a, a difficult process. Nobody gets it off. Uh, no, nobody gets it right first go. If you do, well, great. But it's it's highly unlikely that you will get it right initially. Um, it's a complex system. Things do break. You know, if one cog falls apart, it might affect another thing. Well, you learn from that and maybe detach those two cogs. And once you try and implement all of this you as well can become buzzword compliant. There you've got your buzzword. Uh, I'm Tim, so uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. A little bit shorter than expected. Uh, I am on Twitter just recently, similar to Google Cloud's CEO, who recently joined Twitter as well. Uh, so if you do want to ask questions, if you don't have the time to ask questions now, uh, feel free to uh, get in touch, um, and I hope you enjoy this. Een betere wereld begint met het besef dat er nog een wereld te winnen is. Een wereld waarin gelijke kansen de normaalste zaak van de wereld zijn. Zonder voorsprong. Waarin de innovatie van vandaag niet de zorg van morgen is. Een wereld die geen filter nodig heeft om schoon te zijn. 
en waarin geld schoon is zonder het wit te wassen. Maar wie zijn wij om iets te zeggen? Nog geen 30% van onze top is vrouw. Slechts 15% van onze hypotheken is duurzaam. Tikkie blijft niet eeuwig nu. En we hebben witwassen nog steeds niet de wereld uitgeholpen. Goed bezig zijn is niet goed genoeg. Ja, er is een wereld te winnen. En dat begint bij onszelf. Maar daarvoor hebben we mensen nodig die een verschil kunnen maken. Zoals jij. Begin bij ons.